Uh, good morning, sir. Madam. Neither. Uh, milady. What is this establishment? I do not quite understand, milady. What is its name? The Hotel Cosmopolitan. Precisely, an hotel. It is not, I am given to understand, a railway station in the provinces. No, milady. Nor a country blacksmith's? Uh, certainly not, milady. Then why are my rooms full of smoke? Smoke, soot, stench. A workman has been sent for, milady. I do assure your ladyship that everything is being done. I should hope so. I expect when I return to find the air here fit to breathe. I will see to it myself. You have one hour. Startled me. The workman is coming to fix the grate. Lady Morcar is only just gone. And she will not be back for an hour. No. Not now. Well, what's wrong? You said the man was due. He doesn't matter. We must be careful. <clears throat> you want it? I come to see the uh, fire. Just about time too, Horner. You're late. Oh. Sorry, Mr. Ryder. Uh, I only just got the call. Yes, we'll get on with it now. Well, now that he's here, Miss Cusack, perhaps we can um, deal with that other matter. Very well, sir. Cusack, do be careful. You have no delicacy of touch. Leave it. Leave it, Cusack! I beg your pardon, your ladyship. I don't like too much fussing. You should know that by now. It always shows if one's made fusses too much. Will you be wearing the diamonds, me lady? No. At the opera, everyone wears diamonds. Tonight, I shall wear the blue carbuncle. It's the manager. Some of the police have been robbed. <gasps> Your references are very satisfactory, Mr. Holmes. Lord St. Simon was almost fulsome in his praise of your work. That was very kind of him. I have decided you are the correct person to undertake the recovery of my blue carbuncle. Lady Morcar, I have been trying to explain. I cannot accept your commission. Nonsense. My time over this Christmas period will be completely occupied. Nonsense, Mr. Holmes. You will disengage yourself. The recovery of the jewel is of the utmost importance. Inspector Lestrade is in control of your case. I have no confidence in the ability of the police. <laughs> the inspector is perfectly capable of handling this matter. All he has done is to arrest some wretched workman. Then the case is virtually closed? It is not. The thief may be under lock and key, but the stone is still missing. It will be only a matter of time. I am led to believe you work efficiently and with success. Start immediately. We may name your own fee. <sighs> I advise you to leave this affair in the hands of the police. I don't think you could have understood me, Mr. Holmes. I will pay a large sum, a very large sum, for the recovery of the gem. You will take the appointment. No, Lady Morcar. You're impertinent, sir. I have given you my advice. You refuse to help me. The best facilities for tracing your jewel are in the hands of the Metropolitan Police. You are perverse, Mr. Holmes. In spite of the fact that I have decided you are the correct person to undertake this quest, you deliberately flout me. Now, why, sir? Your case is that of a sneak thief, Lady Morcar. There is not a single aspect of it which is of any interest to me. Good day, Lady Morcar. Oh, 
Hudson, all ready to leave? Yes. I hope your two days in the country will do you good. Uh, thank you. Mrs. Mrs. Hudson has been warned not to expect you back until the 23rd. That is correct? Yes. Excellent. Uh, then you'll be able to accompany me to a recital in the afternoon of Christmas Eve? Eh? Oh, yes, yes, of course. But Holmes, who was that lady who just left? Hmm? Oh, the Countess of Morcar. It is a light but interesting program. Do you see? She seemed very angry. Yes, she was. Is she a client? No. Ah, well, that no doubt explains her anger. Lady Morcar was unable to engage my interest. It was a dull and petty case. Besides, I would rather the strange Christmas was disturbed than mine. I shall get two tickets for that concert. Good heavens! Irene Adler. Mm. Holmes says she's going to sing at the Queen's Hall. I shall be interested to see if her musical talent is equal to her other powers. I'm told her tessitura is quite remarkable. I beg your pardon? Good night, good night, sir. Uh, happy Christmas uh, to you yes. too, sir. Westward leading, still proceeding, guide us through thy perfect night. Thank you, sir. We three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we travel afar. Fields and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. There you are. I, uh, I saw Mrs. Dixon at the station. She asked me to remember to you, and she sent you the compliments of the season. What do you make of it? Eh? I back home. It makes an excellent exercise. You know my methods. What are you doing? Well, hanging up your hat. You seem to want to be rid of it. No, 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 Watson. Examine it. Tell me what you find. Is it a clue? Not a clue, but several. You're on a case. No, 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 no. Here is my glass. Now, tell me about that hat. I'm delighted to see you back. It is lonely here without you. I trust you return my compliments to Mrs. Dixon. Now, what do you find? What do you want me to find? Everything. Take your time. Now, that hat is the trophy of one of those whimsical little incidents which will happen when you have four million people all jostling each other within the space of a few square miles. Well, it's an old, black, ordinary hat. No maker's label. Rather the worse for wear. The lining is, or rather was, red silk. Now much discoloured. The initials HB are embossed inside. How am I doing? Very well. Go on. Well, it's very dusty. It's spotted in some places. It looks as though... Yes. Someone has tried to cover up the spots with black ink. The rim is pierced for a hat securer. Now missing. Excellent, my dear Watson. Continue. That's all. All? Yes. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's very large and rather disreputable. What else do you want me to say? Uh, deductions, Watson. Deductions. Oh. Uh, well, it belonged to a man who has no respect for his clothes. Mm -hmm. And, uh... Yes, wait a minute. He has grey hair, has just had a haircut, and he uses lime cream hairdressing. Bravo! You spotted the clippings and the smell. So, what do we have? A grey-haired intellectual who three years ago was well-to-do but has since fallen on hard times. He once had foresight, he now has less. His wife has ceased to love him and it is doubtful if he has gas laid on in his house. Oh, my dear Holmes, you're certainly joking. Well, not in the least. You have the evidence. Oh, come. Why intellectual? How can you possibly know about the man's financial standing? Firstly, it is a matter of cubic capacity. A man with so large a brain must have something in it. Oh, no, no, no. That's far from medically exact. There are some people with large heads who are congenital idiots. True. But this man leads a sedentary life, indicated by the amount of domestic dust. When new, this hat was a very good one. Notice the quality of the ribbed silk band and the silk lining. 
He had the foresight to take precaution against the wind by having a hat securer fitted, but he has less foresight now, for when it broke, he did not have it repaired. A sedentary man with taste, foresight, and such cranial capacity is unlikely to be an idiot. You have an answer for everything. <laughs> But I notice you have avoided telling me about the man's wealth three years ago and poverty now. Now this once excellent hat is three years old. These flat brims curled at the edges only came into fashion then. If our man could afford such a hat three years ago but has not bought another since or replaced the Segura, then he has surely come down in the world. Well, clear enough, clear enough. <laughs> but please, Holmes, just for my peace of mind, confound me further by telling me why his wife has ceased to love him. <laughs> Well, now, this hat has not been brushed for weeks. When a man is allowed to go about with such an accumulation of dust upon his hat, one fears he has lost his wife's affection. And that is what has happened to Mr. Henry Baker. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Henry Baker? <laughs> the name of the owner. Oh, come now, Holmes, really, you go too far. To assume that the initials H.B. stand for... Well, I mean, they could equally stand for Hathaway Broughton. <laughs> and anyway, he might be a bachelor. Nay, that would be to neglect the evidence of the goose. Goose? Lost by the same man on the corner of Goode Street. It had a label round its neck marked for Mrs. Henry Baker. You saw all of this? <laughs> then you are involved in some crime. No, no, no crime, Watson. Two nights ago, Peterson, the commissioner, saw a man set upon by a couple of roughs. In defending himself, the man broke a shop window. When Peterson rushed up, they all fled. Why? Hmm? Why? I mean, surely this uh, Mr. Henry Baker was the injured party. Ah, but Peterson was in uniform and Baker had broken a window. Seeing an official-looking person running towards him, he panicked and took to his heels. Leaving behind his hat, and his Christmas dinner. Where is this goose now? Well, Peterson has it. I felt it a just reward for his honesty. And you couldn't trace this, Mr. and Mrs. Baker? Well, as there are some hundred or more Henry Bakers in this city of ours, it is not easy to restore lost property to any one of them. Hmm. I wonder. Oh. Oh, nothing. You know, that uh, wretched hat business has made me forget again. Oh, forget what? Uh, oh, this, uh, uh, something I meant to give you before. <laughs> it's a small present for Christmas. My dear old friend. Why, this is so very kind of you. Would you, would you mind? Oh, yeah. oh Watson. <clears throat> oh! And I had so very nearly run out. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid it's not your usual blend, that dreadful black shag, but I feel all like it. Uh, my dear Watson, I, I'm at a loss. Well, that's not like you. <laughs> well, it's merely a token. Yes, but I, I regret that the, the exchanging of presents at Christmas time is something about which I am notoriously lax. My dear Holmes, <laughs> it's of no matter. Uh, I wonder... Yes? I would greatly enjoy a fill of it. <laughs> oh, why? <laughs> why, of course. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, there's still one thing about that um, hat business that puzzles me. Oh, really? But it, it was merely an exercise. Well, how do you know that this Mrs. Baker is not the man's mother? Oh, she would be a very old lady. Uh, possibly, but she might still be able to eat goose. <laughs> <laughs> well, Baker is clearly middle-aged, at least. If he is still living with his mother, they are either very fond of one another, or he is unable to break free and she nags him. In any case, she would never allow him to go about with his hat in that condition. <laughs> Suppose she were an invalid? Ah, then there would most certainly be a servant, and his mother would ensure that Henry's welfare was seen to. No, Mrs. Henry Baker is his wife. You wait there. I can't have people just bursting in but on this me. is important. Peterson. Uh, Mrs. He, Hutton, what is this? He just came rushing up, I've got to see Mr. Holmes. Come in, man, and calm down. Hello, Peterson. I've got to see you, Mr. Holmes. It's a goose, sir. Eh? What of it, then? Has it returned to life and flapped off through the kitchen window? Oh, no, sir. Are you sure you're not busy, sir? Positive, Mrs. Hudson. Thank you. Well, you look at yourself. You see what my wife found in its crop. Good heavens! By Jove, Peterson, this is treasure trove indeed. I suppose you know what you've got. Oh, that's a jewel, sir. It, it cut through glass like putty, sir. It scratched Mrs. Peterson's aquamarine pendant, what she had off her Aunt Betsy when she passed on some years back, sir. Scratched that and took no mark itself. That means that's a good stone, Mr. It is much more than a good stone. It is the stone. It is not. It cannot be the Countess of Morka's blue carbuncle. It is precisely that. This is the gem for which the Times has been carrying an advertisement every day for a week. 
The reward is a thousand pounds. Yes, and that is not a twentieth of its market price. A thousand pounds, such Great Lord of mercy. Well, I, I'm sure it's very lovely, sir, but that does seem a lot of money. Ah, but Mrs. Hudson, this stone is unique. No one has ever found another quite like it. But how did he get into Peterson's goose? Not Peterson's goose, but Mr. Henry Baker's. Now, Peterson. Y yes, sir. Will you go round to the advertising agency and have this put in the evening papers? Yes, very good, sir. Which papers would you like that to appear in, sir? Oh, in the Globe, Star, Pell Mell, St. James's Gazette, Evening News, Standard, Echo, and any others which occur to you. Now, found at the corner of Gould Street, a goose and a black felt hat. Mr. Henry Baker can have the same by applying at number 221B, Baker Street. Yes, that is clear and concise. And this will cover the cost. Thank you. So, w w what, what about the stones? I will keep it for the time being. Thank you. Mrs. Hutton. Yes, sir. Will you get Billy to run out and buy me a goose? Oh, we already had one, sir. Ah, but this one is for Mr. Henry Baker, whose own goose is at this moment trussed and prepared for Mr. Peterson's family. Oh, well, if you ask it, sir, it all seems a puzzle to me. <laughs> ah, it's a bonny thing, Watson. See how it glints and sparkles? A beautiful gem. Yes, indeed. And like every good stone, this one is the nucleus and focus of crime. These are the devil's pet baits. In older and larger jewels, every facet may stand for a bloody deed. In spite of its youth, who would think that so pretty a toy as this has already been responsible for two murders, a suicide, a vitriol throwing, and several robberies? Perhaps we'd best be rid of it. Hmm? Are we to take it to Lady Morcar? No, not yet. As Mrs. Hudson so correctly observes, there is a puzzle here. How did it get in the goose? Precisely. I mean to find out. Did I not read somewhere that uh, Inspector Lestrade has already arrested someone for the theft of the blue carbuncle? Mm. Two nights ago, the young workman who was doing some repair in Lady Morcar's dressing room. Perhaps Baker's his accomplice. Mm. We shall find that out when he answers my advertisement. And I shall determine his innocence by a very simple trick. It might be those roughs who attacked him. They could be in on it. They could have been trying to get it away from him. We cannot come to any conclusion yet, Watson. Yes, John Orner is the young man Lestrade arrested. He is awaiting trial at this very moment. It's all the same to you, Holmes. I think I'll go to bed. Clearly, Baker has not seen your advertisement. Then someone will tell him of it in the morning. Come in. Ah, a visitor, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, no, sir, a message for Dr. Watson. Oh, really? Yes, it's from the police, sir. Oh? Some man has tried to hang himself at the local police station. I must go round at once. This jewel robbery. Our master Order hasn't got much to live for. Order? Oh, no. The Countess of Morker's case, sir. Mm. Uh, seem to be dogged by it. Never do. It goes my judgment. Never do. Take it carefully now. Take it carefully. You're going to be all right. I must congratulate you, Sergeant, on your prompt rescue. 
He had no time to do himself any real harm. Please, sir. You go help me. No, and enough of that. Like them all, Dr. Watson, he claims he's innocent. Oh, I yeah. am. He's a hard case. Uh, Sergeant. Will you leave me with my patient? It's irregular, sir. I don't know. He might do you a violence. I am a physician, not a judge. I see no violence in him, and precious little that is criminal. He won't harm me. Well, sir, I don't know. Thank as you, I Sergeant. Thank you. It was a foolish thing to try. If you're innocent, they'll find it out at the trial. I am. They won't. Because of the other business. What other business? I was in trouble before, sir. They caught me out in a lie. They'll never believe me now. It'll be a long stretch. Not if you are innocent. I was to be married in January. It's all off now. All because of this robbery they say I done. Calm down. I swear I didn't do it. I never even set eyes on a wretched thing. With the blue carbuncle? Yeah, yeah, something like that. You gotta help me. I'm innocent. I'll do what I can. Your advertisement has produced no result. We must think of something else. We do have time on our side. Horner's case does not go before the Assizes until mid-January. Hmm. I am convinced that Horner is innocent. Upon what grounds, Watson? But a guilty man would surely tell a better story. And Horner has scarcely any story to tell. If you had seen him as I did, Holmes, a man who was prepared to die rather than go to prison, I'm sure that you would feel the same. My dear old friend, your conviction does more credit to your heart than to your head. Come in. Ah. Is it all right if I clear away, sir? Oh, yes, yes, of course, Mrs. Hudson. I thought I should let you finish your lunch in peace. But I know Dr. Watson doesn't like to be interrupted. But there is a gentleman waiting to see you, sir. Ah, who is it? He didn't give his name, sir. Oh, let him come up, please, Mrs. Hudson. Yes, certainly, sir. Mm. Do you think this is Baker? Well, I'm expecting no other. And his reticence would fit with his other characteristics. Would you go in, please, sir? Come in. Mr. Holmes? How do you do, sir? My colleague, Dr. Watson. Delighted to make your acquaintance. How do you do? <clears throat> I am led by your advertisement in last evening's newspaper to believe that you have possession of some articles of mine. Uh, to be precise, a hat and a goose. Mr. Henry Baker, I presume? A uh, Harold Baker. What? <laughs> My late brother was Henry. I live with my sister-in-law, and the goose is for her. Ah. <laughs> Pray, take a seat, Mr. Baker. May we offer you a drink? I observe that your circulation is more adapted to summer than winter. It is true, I do feel the cold. That is most kind of you, Doctor. Is uh, this your hat, sir? Yes, Mr. Holmes, that is undoubtedly mine. We had hoped to see an advertisement from you giving your address. <laughs> The shillings are not so plentiful with me now as they once were. I had no doubt that the roughs who assaulted me had carried off both my hat and the bird. I did not care to waste money in a hopeless attempt to recover them. Ah, I understand. You. About your bird, I'm afraid it has gone. Gone? Well, yes. It would have been no use to anyone had we kept it any longer. But I presume that this other goose, which is about the same weight and perfectly fresh, will answer your purpose. Oh, certainly, certainly. Of course, we still have the feathers, legs, crop and so forth of your own bird, should you show... <laughs> they might be useful to me as relics of my adventure, but beyond that I cannot think what use the disjecta membra of my late acquaintance are going to be. Uh, no, sir, I think that with your permission I will confine my attention to the excellent bird I perceive upon the sideboard. There is your hat, then, and there your bird. By the way, would you tell me where you got the other one? I am somewhat of a fowl fancier, and I have seldom seen a better grown goose. Why, certainly. It happens that there are some few of us who frequent the Alpha Inn near the British Museum. We are to be found in the library during the day, you understand. Naturally. This year, our host, 
Windigate, by name, instituted a goose club. Goose club? By which, on consideration of some few pence each week, we were each to receive a bird at Christmas. My pence duly paid, I chose a goose, and the rest is familiar to you. Uh, thank you. It is I who am indebted to you, sir, both for this bird, which will bring an unaccustomed smile to the face of my late brother's wife, and for the return of my hat. Uh, to wear a Scotch bonnet is fit neither for my years nor my gravity. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you both a happy and prosperous New Year. And the same to you, sir. You. Allow me, Mr. Uh, a happy New Year to you. Well, our Mr. Harold Baker has been a great help to us. <laughs> you are developing a certain vein of porky humour, Watson, against which I must learn to guard myself. But you do well to chide me. The sister-in-law was a relationship I should have thought of. It makes this neglect even more understandable. Oh, but you were right in most other respects. Though I did forget to ask him if he had gas laid on in the house. Oh, the, those tallow stains upon his hat which you try to cover with ink must have come from a candle. What man uses a candle if gas is fitted? Now, but supposing his sister-in-law, suffering with him the strictures of poverty, will not allow gas to be used in the house, <laughs> as the candles are cheaper? <laughs> possibly, my dear Watson, very possibly. After the concert this afternoon, will you partake of some refreshment with me at the Alpha Inn in Bloomsbury? Delighted, Holmes. <laughs> and perhaps we may have a few words about geese with mine host, Mr. Mr. Windy Ridge. Windy Gate. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. <laughs> A seasonable cold night. Oh, it is indeed. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, two glasses of ordinary, please, Landlord. Uh, What's on? Windigate? Your beer should be excellent, if it is as good as your geese. My geese, sir? Huh? Yes, I heard of them from a Mr. Harold Baker, who was a member of your goose club. Ah, Mr. Baker. Yes, he hasn't been in since he collected it. I've no doubt he soon will be, to celebrate his good fortune. Well, I hope he enjoys it. <laughs> was it one of your own? Ah, bless you, no, sir. They weren't my geese. I keep a public, not a farmyard. <laughs> <laughs> Whose were they? I got a couple of dozen from a poulter down Covent Garden. Oh, what's his name? His name? Oh, I, I, I do know some of them down there, and uh, as Mr. Baker said, it was an excellent bird. An odd name it was, unusual. <laughs> no, 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 you've got me there, sir. I, I tell you what, I'll look it up in my book. Oh. Oh, sorry, Holmes, I nearly spoiled it. By nonsense. The fellow's gone to find out. Well, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Mm, it may seem so, but don't forget that at one end of the chain we have an ordinary goose, but at the other end there is a man who will get seven years' penal servitude unless we can establish his innocence. I've, uh, I've got it, sir. Uh, Breckenridge was the name. Breckenridge? Oh, no, I'm afraid I don't know him. Well, here's good health to yourself, landlord, and prosperity to your house. Oh, thank you, sir. Come along, Watson. Good night. And a very happy Christmas to you. Oh, good night, sir. And the same to you both. <laughs> good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Our inquiries, Watson, may confirm Horner's guilt. I cannot believe it will be so. In any case, we have a line of investigation that has been missed by Lestrade and which by mere chance has fallen into our hands. Let us follow it to the end. And now for Mr. Breckinridge. Faces to the south, then. And quick march. Try down here, boss. Hmm. Good evening to you. It is a cold night. Yeah. Oh, sold out of geese, I see. You seem to be sold out of geese. If you buy it, you can have 500 in the morning. Uh, in the morning's no good. Yeah, well, no doubt you can find some other stall or some. Ah, but I was recommended to you. Was you? Yes. Who buy it? Windigate, landlord of the Alpha Bloomsbury. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did supply him with some. Oh, and fine birds they were, too. Yeah, no doubt. Where did you get them? 
Well, look, mister, where are you driving at? Come on, let's have it straight. I am speaking straight enough, Mr. Breckenridge. I should like to know who supplied you with the geese that you sold to the Alpha. Yeah, well, I'll talk straight to you too, mister. I'm not telling you. Well, it's a matter of no great importance, but I don't know why you should get so warm over such a trifle. Warm? You'd be warm too if you was as pestered as me, mister. I mean, once you pay good money for a thing, you'd think there's where is the end of the business, but oh no. It's where are them geese? Who'd you sell them geese to and now where do you get them geese from? A man might think they was the only blasted geese in the world. Well, I know nothing about that. I have no connection with anyone else who may have been asking. However, if you won't help me, you won't. And there is an end of it. Yeah, well, then. Come along, Watson. The bet is off. This fellow won't help us. Hey, here, here, here. Oh. Hey, what bet? I know a thing or two about poultry. And I can always back my own opinion when it comes to the matter of fowls. And I have a fiver on it that the bird I ate was bred in the country. Ah. Well, you've been in good and lost your fiver, Governor. Because all Windigate's birds was town bred. Nothing of the kind. The one I ate was bred in the country. It was not. I don't believe you. Look, Mr. Clever Boots, do you know more about fowls than me, then? Me has been handling them since I was a kid. I'm telling you that all the birds that went to the Alpha was town bred. You will never persuade me to believe that because I know. Well, you bet on it, then. <laughs> well, it's merely taking your money, but yes. Just to teach you not to be so obstinate, I'll wager a sovereign. Ha. Right then, Mr. Cockshaw. And you, sir. I thought as how I was out of geese, but it would seem we've still got one here. Now then, you see this little book? Hmm? Well? This here's an account of my suppliers. In the back there, we've got the country suppliers, and in the front here, the town ones. Now then, do you mind reading out that item there? Mrs. Oakshot, 117 Brixton Road, Eggs and Poultry, page 43. Ah, that refers to this ledger. Here's all my buying and selling. Now ah, then. 43. Ah, sir, if you've got no objection, do you mind reading out that item there? <coughs> yes, uh, December the 18th, from Mrs. Oakshot, 24 geese at seven and sixpence. And just below that, sir. Sold to Windigate, the Alpha Inn, 12 shillings. What have you to say now, sir? <laughs> you seem amused at the loss of your sovereign, Holmes. When you see a fellow with whiskers of that cut, Watson, and a copy of the Finken protruding from his pocket, you can always draw him by a wager. I could have laid a hundred pounds in front of him, and he would never have given me as much information as he did when he thought he was doing me down over a wager. Yes, it would seem that he refused his other questioners. Clearly so, and as there are others who seem anxious about this matter, the point to be decided is whether we visit her, Mrs. Oakshot tonight, or leave it until tomorrow. Well, it is getting rather late, Holmes. Yeah. Now, we do have the blue carbuncle after all. And you're anxious for your supper. Geese! I'm fed up with you and your geese! You want to buy a goose off me, you come back tomorrow morning. I don't want a goose tomorrow. Then you could go to the devil. But I must know who bought the others. Look, if I have any more of your silly questions, I'll set the dog on you. Mrs. Oakshot said... Mrs. Oakshot, you bring her here, I'll tell her. I mean, who do you think you are? Did I buy the geese off you? Didn't? No, but one of the geese was mine! No, Mrs. Oakshot. Uh, Mrs. Oakshot asked me to ask you. Look, you can ask the King of Prussia for all I can. I've had enough of you. Be off with you. Have a word off. With this fellow. Be off with you. I'm here pestering me about your geese. Oh, what are you not gaping at? Hey, go on, get out of it. Who are you? What do you want? Just a question, if you'll excuse me, sir. I could not help but overhear your conversation with Mr. Breckenridge, uh, and I believe I can be of some assistance to you. What could you know about this? Who are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes. It is my business to know what other people do not. You can know nothing about this? Excuse me, but I know everything. You are endeavouring to trace some geese, are you not? Yes. Well, 24 geese were sold by Mrs. Oakshot of Brixton Road to Mr. Breckenbridge for a certain sum of money. He, in turn, sold them for a larger amount to the landlord of an inn who was running a goose club of which a Mr. Harold Baker was a member. Yes, but what was the name of the inn, sir? That is precisely what I'm trying to find out. Why? Uh, I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to reveal that. <sighs> yeah, and I, I think we'd better discuss this matter in a cosy room rather than this windswept marketplace. Watson, could you find us a cab? Certainly. Uh, by the way, sir, pray tell me, whom have I the pleasure of assisting? My name is Jane... Uh, 
John Robinson. Oh, come, sir, your real name, please. It is always awkward doing business with an alias. Well, very well, if you must know, it's James Ryder. Precisely, sir. You are an under-manager at the Hotel Cosmopolitan, and you have been of great assistance to the police, I believe. Oh, yes? Oh, fine. I shall be able to tell you everything you want to know when we get to Baker Street. Here we are. You seem cold, Mr. Ryder. You are shivering. Pray take that chair. Now, Mr. Ryder, what is it you wish to know? Which pub was it that these geese went to? The Alpha Inn in Bloomsbury. But I do not think that will help you, for I think you are only interested in one particular goose. A white bird with a black bar across its tail. Yes. Do you know what happened to it, where it went? Certainly. Came here. Here? To you? Yes. And the most remarkable bird it proved. I'm not surprised you should take such an interest in it. Why, what do you mean? It laid an egg after it was dead. A beautiful, bright, blue egg. That's mine! Hold on, man, you'll be in the fire! That's it, Watson. <laughs> Thank you. It seems a waste, but I suppose he ought to have a dash of brandy. An excellent idea, Watson. He's not got blood enough to go into felony with impunity. What a shrimp it is, to be sure. Compose yourself, Mr. Ryder. Are you prepared to talk? Give me a minute, please, sir. <laughs> That's better. Now you begin to look a little more human. Since I have every link in my hands and all the proof I need, there is very little you have to tell me. Still, that little may as well be cleared up just to make the case complete. In the first place, how did you know where the stone was kept? Oh, Catherine Cusack, her ladyship's maid, she told me. She, well, she, she egged me on. She, we were going to... We had intended to... I see. The temptation of easily acquired wealth was too much for you. I've never stolen so much as a farthing before, Mr. Holmes. You've got to believe We're me. We're hardly talking of farthings. You have the makings of a pretty villain, Ryder. You knew that you could accuse Horner and that suspicion would rest easily upon him because he had been in trouble before. I suppose you arranged that he was to be the one to come and do the repair in Lady Morcar's dressing room. Yes, well, her ladyship had been complaining as usual and... The regular man was away. So you and this woman, Cusack, seized your opportunity. After Horner had left, you rifled the jewel case, raised the alarm and had the unfortunate man arrested. You'll never forgive myself, Mr. Holmes. For pity's sake, have mercy on me. I've never done nothing wrong before. You've got to believe me. Get up, man. Get up and sit over there. It's all very well for you to cringe and crawl now that you've found out, but what about Horner? You sent him to the dock for a crime he knew nothing about. Yeah, I'll write a confession. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave the country. I'll do anything you want. Only please, please, don't hand me over to the police. Hmm. What happens will depend upon you. Firstly, give us a true account of how the jewel got into the goose and the goose onto the open market. The truth, Ryder. For there is your only hope of safety. I'll oh, try, sir. I'll try to tell it exactly as it happened. Oh. After they arrested Horner. At your instigation. Yes, well, I, I realised I'd got to get rid of the stone quickly before the police took it into their heads to search me. Yes, that thought might have occurred to Lestrade's sense of the obvious. Go on, Ryder. I didn't dare leave it in the hotel, so I slipped out for an hour and I went straight to my sister's place in the Brixton Road. Ah, the celebrated Mrs Oakshot. Yes, that's right, sir. She, she fattens foul for the market. Well, all the way there, every man I saw seemed to be a policeman or a detective, and although it was bitterly cold, the, the sweat was pouring down my face. When I got to her place, I must have looked so odd because she, she asked me what was wrong. Well, I told her about the robbery in the hotel, and I said I was upset because it was on my floor. Then I, I went out the back by the goose pens to smoke a cigarette and think things out. 
Well, I've got this friend up in Kilburn who served time, and I, I knew he'd show me how to turn the stone into money, but the thing was, how was I going to get the stone to him in safety? I mean, supposing they searched me and they found the blue carbuncle in my pocket. Well, suddenly an idea came to me that would beat the best detective that ever lived. You promised me one for Christmas. I was just selecting one. But we've got yours set aside already. Jim's bird, we call it. It's that big white one over there. Well, look, if, it, if it's all the same to you, Maggie, I'd, I'd rather have the one I handled. But we've patterned yours up special. 26 birds there are, two dozen for the market, one for you and one for us. Yours and ours are a good three pounds heavier than yes, the well, rest. Yes, that's very kind of you, Maggie, but uh, I don't want you to think I'm ungrateful, but I'd rather have the other. Oh, all right then, but don't expect any favours in the future. Thank you, Maggie. Which is the one that's so taken your fancy? The one with the barred tail. Uh, look, can I take it with me now? Do what you like, but you can catch it and kill it yourself, because I'm not going to. Well, I got the bird to swallow the stone before my sister interrupted. Now I caught it and I killed it and I, I took it to my friend's place. Well, we cut the bird open, we sliced that bird up into to little bits, but there was no sign of the jewel. My heart turned to water. I rushed straight back to my sister's place, but when I got there, the pen was empty. Maggie, where are they? Where are the geese? I knew you'd not be satisfied, Jim, but you took your goose, now you can lie on it. I took the wrong one. Don't tell me. I told you that before. But you would have one of them pair with the barred tails. Do you mean there were two like that? Of course there were. Like as two peas. Maggie, who did you sell them to? I've got to know. Well, same as always, of course. Breckenridge is a common garden. What is all this, Jim? Jim, come back here when I tell you. I went to Breckenridge again and again. I pleaded with him. I begged him to tell me where he told those geese. But he was always as you saw him this evening. I knew tonight was my last chance. Why? Well, this being Christmas Eve, by this time tomorrow, every one of those geese will be eaten. It's the truth, Mr. Holmes. I swear, every word is true. And now I'm branded a thief without having got anything from the world for which I lost my character. God help me, Mr. Holmes. Ryder. Yes, sir. I'm here. Sign that, and then get out. You have about 12 hours before the police see this, so go. God bless you, Mr. Go! Was that wise? We have proof of Horner's innocence. And we have Lady Morgard's jewel. And I am not retained by the police to supply their deficiencies. Lestrade had no right to arrest the most obvious suspect before making a search of everyone concerned. I suppose you have a point. Oh, I am compounding a felony, no doubt, but I am also saving a soul. Send Ryder to jail now and he'll be a jailbird for life. But he has been so frightened this time, he should not go wrong again. Besides, my dear old friend, this is a season of forgiveness. You're ready then. Well, come on. You're an idiot. You have no idea as to what to do. And don't say you're sorry. Do the thing properly. You certainly are extremely trying. See who that is. Thank you. Good day, Lady Morcar. I do hope you will forgive this intrusion. Ah, Mr. Holmes, I'm glad you've chosen to call. I've been expecting you for several days. 
I have a second commission for you. A second? Another theft? Somebody has kidnapped my maid, Cusack. She vanished in the night. Are you certain she has not left of her own free will? Nonsense. She was devoted to me. I always make it a rule to have absolutely faithful servants. I regret that the loss of your maid does not appeal to me as a case. Mr. Holmes, I am prepared to overlook your past ill manners. My niece recently spent a few days with Sir Henry Baskerville, and he was positively effusive in his praise of your work. Now, you will find both my jewel and my maid. Neither, Lady Morgan. Mr. Holmes! I uh, believe this is yours. My blue carbuncle. Your maid has run off with the man who removed it from your room. Fortunately, he lost it. This gentleman found it and brought it to me. I have no doubt you wish to reward him. Come, Watson, our commission is at an end. Good day, Lady Morgar, and a happy Christmas to you all. Thank you, my dear Holmes, thank you. I wouldn't mind being knocked down a hundred times by her just to see you do that again. My dear Watson, we must return to Baker Street and undertake another investigation in which also a bird will be the chief feature. <laughs> <laughs>